Hamid Abu Arara takes out his mobile phone. He wants to show us a short video and then a photograph. It will not make for easy viewing. The film is taken from a traffic camera at a rural T-junction not far from the Israeli border with the Gaza Strip. It is 7.05 a.m. on the morning of October 7th, or Black Saturday as Hamid and so many other Israelis describe the day. As the footage begins, a black Hyundai appears from the side road. It stops because four motorcycles are approaching from the left. This is a fatal mistake. Each bike carries two men, and as they turn into the road from which the Hyundai has emerged, each pillion passenger rakes the stationary car with automatic gunfire. You can see the windows dissolve into a haze of glass. Bullets bounce off the road. The car has stopped forever. Ahmed scrolls further into his phone's picture library and finds another image. It is a photograph of a middle-aged woman. She is wearing a hijab and is covered in blood and is slumped lifeless across the steering wheel of the same Hyundai. Ahmed, a tough Bedouin farmer, begins to weep. This is his beloved wife Fatima, who had been driving him to work as she did every day, until they met with Hamas. Fatima's murder was only the start of an epic seven-hour ordeal, as Hamid strove to save himself, their wounded eight-month-old son Elias, and another Bedouin, after they were caught at the very epicenter of the bloodletting. Theirs is surely one of the most extraordinary survival stories to have emerged from the October 7th massacres. But it also serves to throw a light on an underreported aspect of the atrocities. How Hamas gunmen did not hesitate to execute or kidnap fellow Muslims whom they came across during their two-day rampage. Male photographer Jamie Wiseman and I travelled to the Negev Desert in southern Israel, where some 200,000 members of Israel's Bedouin Arab community live in tumble-down towns or villages or more traditional nomadic encampments. We spoke to Bedouin families whose members were either killed or taken hostage by Hamas. Their people largely inhabit the physical, economic and social margins of Israeli society, but not marginal enough for Hamas's terrorists. Hamid and Fatima had seven sons and two daughters. The youngest is Elias, and at 6.40 a.m. on Black Saturday, Fatima drove them from their home in Rahat towards the hothouse tomato business that Hamid ran, only a few miles from the Gaza boundary. Two Bedouin farm labourers, a father and a son, were sitting either side of Elias, who was in a baby chair on the back seat. After the motorcycles passed us, I tried to raise Fatima from where she had fallen, and that is where I saw that she had been hit 20 times. He says the gunman must have known that she was of their own faith. We're a religious Muslim family, and she wore a traditional headdress of a devout woman. It is inconceivable that they could not see who was inside. They were five metres away from her as they passed and the windows were rolled down. She told me she could not feel her legs. I knew she was close to death. Being a devout Muslim, I asked her to say the Shahada prayer, which you say before you die. She said it four times, and before the fifth time, she was dead. I got out of the car and opened Fatima's door and closed her eyes. Then I called the police, who answered, but said they were overwhelmed. They said they would get to me as soon as they could. The survivors were on their own. Hamid then heard the young labourer who had been sitting behind Fatima calling for help. He had also taken the brunt of their attack. We pulled him out of the car and laid him under a tree. He said the final prayer, and a few minutes later he too passed on. Baby Elias had also been hit by a bullet fragment between his shoulder blades. My son was in shock, unnaturally still. I shook him, and he started crying. Then we had to look for a place to hide. The only sanctuary was a derelict hut by the roadside. We closed the door and waited for rescue. It would be a long and terrifying vigil. Hamas was all around them, and the temperatures soared. The baby was still breastfeeding. We had one bottle of formula that Fatima had prepared for the journey. That soon ran out, and my son grew very unhappy. He was crying, and that became very dangerous for us. At around noon, Hamid looked through a crack in the metal door of the hut. 
and saw that Hamas terrorists had returned to the junction. The location seemed to have become a rendezvous for groups of gunmen who went off on bikes, pickups and stolen cars to attack nearby communities. For five hours, I secretly observed them coming and going, shooting and killing, somewhere and then coming back. Then one group left and almost immediately returned, and I grew very concerned. It seemed that they wanted to set up an ambush at the junction, and so four of them hid behind it. I could hear them discussing the situation. They were literally centimetres away from us. It was then that Elias began crying again, and I heard the terrorists speak and say that they heard the baby. I heard them loading their guns. They were coming to finish me off. But then I heard Hebrew from the other side. I heard the army had come. It was then that the firefight started, and we were caught right in the middle. At first, the soldiers were confused. I think Hamas shot one of them, and then everyone was firing, and I lay down and covered my son. The soldiers were firing into the heart. I asked him what would have happened if he had stepped out and tried to reason with the Hamas gunman, pleading that he was a Muslim civilian. Are you insane? First of all, do not be impressed by any humanitarian gestures from Hamas. These are only calculated for the foreign press. They are killing machines. The reason I could not appeal to them as a Muslim is that they had already killed my wife. While in the hut, I also heard and saw them stop two other Bedouin guys in the car at the junction. The guys told them they were Arabs, Bedouin. Hamas put their guns into their car and killed them at point-blank range, Hamid says. I had to make a quick decision. I was blessed by Allah with a strong heart. At that moment, I had to choose how we were going to die. There was a lull in the gun battle, and I thought the soldiers would now prepare to throw grenades at the hut. I decided I'd rather die by bullets. He says he took off his shirt to show that he was not wearing a suicide vest, hugged Elias to his chest, and burst through the door of the hut that faced the IDF positions. They fired me all at once. They missed but hit the metal doors, and I got shrapnel from them in my back. Then I heard a commander shouting, cease fire, and saying, this must be the guy who sent us the reports from the junction. There were lots of hugs. The officers were grateful. What Hamid says next is unexpected amid the polarised and poisonous narrative of this current war. The soldiers said I was a hero. I told them I am a citizen of this country. I was only doing my duty. He says the Hamas gunmen behind the hut were killed. As we talk, an unexpected figure walks through the door. It is a huge, heavily bearded Jewish volunteer medic, wearing a yarmulke and carrying a basket of fruit as a gift. At last, I've found you again, he says to Hamid. This is Ariel, who was the first paramedic responder on the scene when Hamid and his son were rescued. Hamid was screaming all the way to the hospital, they murdered my wife, Ariel recalls. The baby was in total shock. I bandaged his wound. The Muslim Bedouin and the Jew hug. An unusual sight in this disastrous time.